YouTube is rammed full of videos about the development of computers. Working through the mainframe and mini-computer era, and particularly concentrating on the microcomputer era of the 1980s. In fact, I've made one or two myself. And in these videos, we concentrate on how the machines developed over time, how memory changed, how the CPU changed. But there's one thing we seem to keep ignoring, and that's displays. So I'm going to attempt to redress the balance, or at least in my own content. So welcome to the abridged history of computer display technology. Ooh. But before we get into that, of course, there is the obligatory, a quick word from our sponsors. And as those of you who have been watching for a while will know, the sponsor of today's video is PCB, wait, purveyor of printed circuit boards. Yes, Perry, that's what it stands for. But they also do things like CNCing and 3D printing, injection mold making, and they'll even put components on your board for you. They really are quite busy by the sounds of things. Oh, and of course, they sponsor about three quarters of the videos on YouTube as well. Honestly, I'm beginning to think that the whole PCB thing's just a bit of a side hustle for them, and they're mostly into content creation. I should probably say what this video is going to be and what it's not going to be. Let's start with the not. This is not going to be an exhaustive history of every single display technology ever created, because A, that video would be very, very long, and B, that video would be very, very dull. To get to where we are now, there's been a whole bunch of blind alley style technologies out there, some of which are interesting and some of which really, really are not. So I'm not going to cover every single one of them. What I am going to do though, is try and give you the general sweep of how we got from where we started to where we are now. And I may take a little detour into some of the weird stuff along the way. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's me, of course I'm going to do that. Let's go all the way back through time to the very early beginnings of computers, and to what is widely now acknowledged to be the world's first computer, Colossus. Although if you're reading a textbook that's a little bit old, it won't mention its existence at all, because we kept it about as secret as a secret thing can be. At the National Museum of Computing, on the Bletchley Park site, although not part of the same museum for... yeah, you'll find a rebuild of Colossus, and there the people who operate it quite frequently apparently get asked the question, where's the screen? Many of us assume that computers always had a, an output screen, a display, something you could see stuff on. But this is not the case, the only output device attached to that thing is a printer. And when I say printer, what I really mean is an electric typewriter. Now, I think the reason they get asked that question is everyone just assumes as long as this has been a computer, there's probably been some sort of display for it, right? I mean, how else were you going to use it? But we didn't use early computers in the way that we use them now. With early machines, we're just concentrating on getting anything working at all. In fact, the Colossus, the machine I mentioned earlier, that is essentially a single-purpose computer. It's got one job to do, and that's to generate candidate keystreams for decoding messages from German High Command. You could, in theory, reprogram it to do other things, and by reprogram, I mean rewire. And that was true of all the other machines developed just slightly after it. The US's first machine, ENIAC, also had the same restrictions in that you could reprogram in it by essentially rewiring it. When you've got that level of complexity going on, getting anything out of it, even if it's just printed on a piece of paper by an old typewriter, seems pretty darn fantastic. Now luckily we don't stay in the era of let's rewire it to program it for very long, and soon we get into the era of actual software. And the first machine to get there is the Manchester Small Experimental Machine, affectionately known as the Baby. For American computer scientists, it's actually pretty shocking that this thing seems like it came out of absolutely nowhere, because they had no idea that the stuff they thought was brand new and cutting edge was something that the British had done quite a few years earlier. And some of that Bletchley Park team were involved in developing the baby. Now, I mention this not just to give the baby some form of historical context as to how it got to be, but rather there's one technology in here that some people think of as one of the first display technologies. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that because this was not intended to be a display technology. It was just a handy side effect, but I'm gonna cover it because it is interesting and also it helps me introduce another display technology later on. See, there is method to my madness. The thing I'm talking about is the Williams Kilburn tube, which is an early memory technology. Memory was a particularly hard problem for early computer pioneers. We had reasonable ways to do logic circuits using valves and then later transistors. However, using those same electronic techniques when it came to memory, well, there was a problem. Creating even a single bit of memory required a surprisingly large number of either valves or transistors. So having even a small amount of memory would require a vast quantity of power and space. Now, both Williams and Kilburn had been involved in radar development work during the Second World War. So we're both pretty familiar with cathode ray tube technology, the sort of thing that we later used to, you know, make TV go. And they found themselves at Manchester University, along with Max Newman, who had been involved with Colossus at Bletchley Park. 
Now, the idea that Williams and Kilburn had come up with is that you could use a CRT to both store and read electronic data. Now, the key advantage of this approach is it would allow for random access, whereas other proposed schemes to provide electronic memory couldn't be, like a mercury delay line. And this is why Magister built the small experimental machine, the baby. It was to prove the Williams Kilburn tube. Now, we're probably all mostly familiar with how a CRT does what it does. You have an electron beam that strikes a phosphor layer at the other end of the tube, and if it strikes it with enough energy, i.e. the voltage is high enough, well then, it makes that phosphor glow. And once you've got past that initial threshold value, increasing the voltage makes the phosphor glow a bit brighter. And this is basically how a TV works. You vary the intensity of the electron beam so the picture gets brighter or darker. That's how we get our images we scan from left to right, top to bottom. Williams and Kilburn took a 6-inch diameter CRT and would trace a line from left to right, then step down a line and trace again. If they wanted a 1 to be represented there, well, the electron beam would be turned up sufficiently to make the phosphorus glow. If you wanted a 0, well, you'd make sure that the electron beam was not sufficient to make the phosphorus glow. So that gives us our scheme for writing. But how do we read? Well, essentially, you scan the surface of the CRT again with the electron beam. However, this time the beam sets so low that it won't cause the phosphorus to glow. Where the beam hits some phosphorus that's not glowing, it still causes some electrons to splash off from the other side. And those are picked up by a thin metal plate that sits on the outside of the tube at the display end. It catches those electrons and essentially senses a current. Where the beam hits phosphorus that's already glowing, well, that's already been depleted of electrons, so there's no electron splash. Therefore, we don't have a current between the CRT and the small metal plate. There's a lot more detail to this that I'm not going to go into, like how you refresh it, etc. But we've established the principle of here we have what is essentially a display device, or normally is used that way, being used as a memory storage device, rather than as a display device for the computer. So this would seem pretty clear. A Kilburn tube, it's memory, not display. Even if it does use what is traditionally seen as a display component. However, there's a but, and it's a big but, I cannot lie. If you pull down the metal plate in the front, you can see all the dots. Now this is a fact that system operators took advantage of. They would fold down the little metal panel and then they could see what's in memory. This meant if the software you fed it wasn't doing the thing you thought it was going to, well, you could debug the problem and work out, is it my program or is it the hardware? Now, despite the fact that people were looking at this thing, this is why I don't count this as a display technology. That's not its primary purpose. They did not intend for people to be looking at it. It's not a purposeful display. It just happens to be that there's a side effect that you can use to observe what's in memory. But it's still a debugging aid. It's not that people are using it to purposefully display stuff. But you can see why some people might view it that way. In fact, if you'd wanted to, you could have put a very particular pattern in memory to make something that looks like a picture on this thing. As we progress on from these early experimental machines and we start to get into the world of commercial systems, from a display point of view, not a lot is really going on. Most commercial computing that's happening is what's referred to as batch mode. In this way of operating, the computer would be run over a batch of data. It would do its job and then it would stop. A developer would create their program, get it all up on punch card and put it and any data they had on punch cards into a pigeonhole for a machine operator to then take out and run on the machine. And they might get returned a nice printout with some summarized data in and possibly some other data outputted on punch cards as well. So in batch mode, there's no interaction with the computer. The job just starts and finishes either successfully producing some output on a printer, or it crashes, and that's it, job over. So in this era, we don't really have display technology because there's nothing to interact with. What we do have, however, is a series of indicator lamps on the front of the machine so the system operator can kind of tell what's going on. After all, if a program's crashed and stuck in a loop, you kind of need to know. Now, these sort of indicator systems became known as blinking lights because, well, the lights that blink. And pretty much all mainframes of this period had a blinking lights interface you could use to see what was happening. But again, this is not a display technology. It is used by the operator of the system to see what's going on, but it's not directly under the control of software being used for the purpose of, well, displaying stuff. It's just showing you the machine state. Now, of course, like anything like this, you can, of course, misuse it to try and do some form of display work. For example, when early micros got this as a interface to control the machine, there was a game called Chase the Bit. That game would illuminate all the lamps in turn, so it looked like there was a bit moving from right to left, and you had to press a switch underneath the lamp 
at the right time, so you caught the bit. But again, this is another case of using a thing that's connected to a computer for one purpose and repurposing it for something slightly else. It's not still a computer display as such. Now, in batch computing, there's no need for a display technology, but batch computing didn't hold sway forever. There were a number of limitations with it. Everyone who used the computer was very far removed from it. You couldn't just write some code, quickly run your job, see if your program worked. You had to wait for your time, your slot. You'd all be waiting in a queue. It also meant that any data that the system was going to use, well, it had to be collected outside the system, put onto punch cards, collated, and then put together for the machine. The computer itself didn't really take part in the data collection process. So it became pretty clear that batch processing it wasn't going to be the future for everything. And here we get two key developments happening at more or less the same time. They were the idea of developing a smaller scale computer that could be used by a small number of users, where the user and operator are one and the same thing. And the other is that of time sharing, which would allow multiple users to make use of a bigger machine at the same time. Both these two things lead us to the concept of interaction with the machine. On the smaller machine, the significantly lower user count per machine meant that it was worth having your ability to interact with the machine so you could do stuff that you couldn't do before. As the computer could be the tool of one person, rather than the tool of the entire finance department, the stock department, and everyone else in the company. The other approach being that of time sharing, where you thinly slice the time of a bigger machine. If you're going to thinly slice the time of the machine between people, then people are going to need a way to interact with the machine to tell it what they want it to do. And it was this need for interaction that drives our first display technologies. And there's two particular ones I want to talk about. Now, they both happen at the same time, but I can't talk about two things at once, so I'm going to have to do them in an order. So, I'm going to start with a vector display on the DEC PDP machines. Now, with the PDP range, DEC created what's referred to as the first mini system. Now, this is the idea of a smaller computer that's used by a small number of users, say, one or two people in a department. And with the early PDP machines, DEC makes available something known as a vector display. Now, this is one of the first purposeful display technologies that puts something a user might want to see on a screen. Now, as I mentioned earlier, cathode ray tubes have been around for a while. We're even in the era of TV at this point. However, a vector display works differently to how a TV works. In fact, it works more like how an oscilloscope works, which again was already a thing at this point. Now, I don't have a deck vector display to show you, so I'm going to illustrate it using this thing, an early 80s games console called a Vectrex. Now, the display in this doesn't work like a CRT TV. In a TV, you essentially have the electron beam scanning across the screen, then it steps down one line, scans across again, with the varying intensity of the electron beam, making the phosphorus glow or not glow. That's how we get our image. A vector display doesn't work that way. The electron beam doesn't scan from left and right, slowly progressing one line down the screen each time. With the vector display, what we have is we can steer the beam to the left and right and top and bottom, and we control the brightness of it. And that's how we draw the individual lines on the screen. We direct the beam to make the path of the line. It works much more like an etcher sketch does than a TV, which is just what this Vectrex here is doing. The problem for this kind of display and why it took us so long to get to this technology is that after you've drawn the line, after a relatively short amount of time, it fades. So in order for whatever we're displaying to remain on the screen, we have to keep redrawing it. And if we're going to keep redrawing it, the machine has to remember, well, what it's supposed to be drawing. And this is what meant that this technology took so long to appear, because memory was a difficult and expensive problem to solve. So our Vectrex here, it has essentially a chunk of memory that's dedicated to storing all the lines that needs to be drawn and the hardware keeps running through that list and drawing them on the CRT. And our early PDPs, it had the same thing. Now for our Vectrex here, they're relatively cheap for the time, modernish DRAMs. Little microchips, you know, the thing you're used to to seeing as memory. For the DEC PDP-1, well, we're nowhere near that sophisticated yet. DRAMs have yet to be invented. We're using what's referred to as core memory at this point. Yes, they finally got past things like the Kilburn tube, and using mercury in little glass tubes as well to store stuff. Here we have a collection of little ferrite rings, with each ring representing either a 1 or a 0, depending on which way round it's magnetized. Now, as you can imagine, wiring together millions of tiny ferromagnetic rings is an incredibly time-consuming and expensive process. This means that the most expensive thing in the computer of this era is its memory, 
So up until this point, computer's memory had just been used for storing data and running code. The idea of dedicating some of it to making a display output work, well, you need one heck of a use case for that. Now on mini computers, this just about made sense, because the machine is to give a highly expensive tool to a limited number of people, and graphical interaction with the machine, well, that increases the utility of that tool. They can do things like design work on it. The other reason this is viable is a mini computer's a lot cheaper than the mainframe. So a company can afford to give this tool to a very limited number of users in the company and still have it be financially viable. And this is why this sort of display technology becomes much more of a mini computer thing than a mainframe thing, or at least at this point in time. This neatly brings me on to the next display technology I'm going to talk about. Now this one's much more mass market because it can work on mainframes, so it's good for the whole time slicing thing. It's also used on mini computers because we need to input things like text and numbers and display them. And the vector display, well, it's not very good for displaying text, is it? The technology we're talking about is that of the teletype. Now this technology existed separate from computers, in fact quite a long time before many computers came into existence, but had all the properties that they were looking for in a device to do some interaction. You had a keyboard for inputting data, you had a way to display stuff that did not require the computer to remember anything at all. And they already existed, so you could just buy one and design the interface to connect it up to your computer. Now, teletype machines were built for sending telexes, essentially text over a phone line, although it is its own separate network from the regular phone network. Yeah, let's not go into the whole telex thing right here and now. But what you've essentially got is a device that's like a glorified typewriter. And some of the more simple ones are actually just modified typewriters. And it prints characters just like it would on a regular typewriter. There's a roll of paper, it prints characters, the carriage moves along, eventually you hit the end of the line, carriage return, the carriage returns back to one side, the paper rolls up, it starts printing the next line. Now some of them were a bit more fancy that you could pre-type stuff and it punch it out on paper tape and you could read it back in and it was like you were typing it again. But no matter the fanciness of your particular teletype machine, this opened up a whole new world for computing. We now have an actual display device that regular normal human beings can look at and read the output of and provide input into the computer. Up until this point, your only interaction with the machine had really been in the form of punch cards. If you were someone entering data into a system, you would sit there with your mechanical machine punching little holes in a card, and then eventually a collection of these cards would be put in a pigeonhole, and that data would eventually get used by a system operator. You have not touched or used the computer itself in any way, shape or form as part of this process. And if you get any response back from any of the jobs you're running, the most you're going to end up with is a printout or some more punch cards in your pigeonhole. With a teletype machine now attached, a user can input data live into the system. The system can validate that data as they're inputting it as well. A user can also make liveish queries of the system. For example, if they want to know how many Chelsea buns are we about to dispatch today? Well, that's a thing that they could get from the system fairly live, rather than having to talk to a system operator that would eventually run a job that would kind of provide a printout at some point in time. For software developers, this was a huge change. They could actually create and edit their program on the computer they were going to run it on and run it when they felt like. It wasn't again all punch cards in a pigeonhole and you either got back at sort of two in the morning that your job had worked or your job had failed. Debugging of your code on the computer became an actual thing. And this is the level of jump you get with what is essentially the most primitive display technology you can imagine. A typewriter connected to a computer. Now this sort of technology hung around for a long time, or at least in computing terms. In fact, when better display technologies came along, these solutions were still referred to as hard copy terminals and kept in use for a long time. In fact, there's remnants of this technology still around today. If you're a Unix or Linux user, you might have noticed that all your serial port devices are referred to as dev TTY. So for example, the first serial port on your machine, TTY S0. Second one, TTY S1. Any USB ones, TTY USB 0, for example. Well, the TTY part of that stands for teletype because in the early Unix days, that's what you had connected to those devices. It's where the teletype machines plugged in. In fact, even the virtual console on your machine is referred to as a virtual TTY. The other place you may have encountered the legacy of this is if you've ever used a single line text editor, like Ed, for example. Ed the editor, not Ed the person, although an Ed may have actually used Ed. The reason for this is you can't exactly scroll the TTY back again and start changing stuff. Everything must be done on the live line that's being printed at the moment. And this is what these text editors were there to do. You could edit a text file, but only one line at a time. I happen to have one of these editors on my Amiga, and 
Yeah, at the time, it confused the heck out of me as to why anyone would design anything this way. But I was born after TTYs were a thing. Now, it's really not hard to realise what the limitations of this sort of technology was. I mean, for a start, you've got paper coming out everywhere, you're using ink, it's fairly slow, it's really, really noisy. I mean, when Dave brought the one that I filmed to the museum for our retro computing event, I was in another room and I could hear him turning that thing off and on, as it's always making an incredible volume of noise, even when it's not printing anything and you're not typing anything in, due to the motor that's constantly running inside this thing. However, of all the limitations I've just mentioned in this kind of technology, the biggest one is that you can't go back up and edit stuff that's been printed out already. The display isn't really interactive in that sense. You can only append more data to the output. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, and possibly currently screaming at YouTube, is that there's a clear way that they could, well, make this technology better. Instead of outputting to paper, you could use a CRT as a display. Then, you can array stuff that's gone before, and you can change the output of more than one line. This is getting more like a proper computer display, right? And what's holding this technology back is RAM. We've got the CRT, we've got enough electronics that we can get some text on the screen if we wanted to. What we're missing is the cost-effective bit of memory. If you're going to keep displaying text on a machine, it has to be held in memory so it can keep being regenerated on the CRT. Teletypes neatly avoid the need for any kind of memory because it's just appending on a piece of paper. The paper is the memory, if you like. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is we will eventually get that sort of technology. In fact, they were referred to as glass TTYs at one point, and that would evolve into the terminal. But there's a little bit of an intermediate step there. And again, this all comes down to memory. Even when these devices first appeared, it was too expensive to put core memory in a terminal. Core memory was still incredibly expensive to create, and if you were going to pay for more of it, you were going to put it inside the computer itself. So here's where we get an interesting point in the evolution of the terminal. IBM comes up with this box that is essentially a display controller. It has a couple of lines out to the computer that fake the TTY devices. And then you plug the video lead of a couple of CRTs into it and some keyboards. And this display controller box essentially acts as multiple terminals. Now, it has some memory inside it, but it's not core memory. Now, I'm going to introduce the last memory technology of this video, and it's possibly the craziest of all of them. It's what's known as delay memory, or delay line memory. Now, I had mentioned earlier something called mercury delay line memory, but this, this works on a different principle. What you have is a piece of wire coiled round in, well, to make what looks like a clockwork spring. On the outside end of this, it's either twisted to the left or to the right. One direction being a one, the other direction being a zero. That twist left or right then essentially propagates along the length of the piece of wire round the coil until it eventually hits the other end, where it's picked up by a little transducer that turns that left or right vibration into either the zero or the one, effectively, with a bit of accompanying circuitry to go with that. That value can then be used by whatever circuitry wanted to remember something, and optionally can be sent back to the actuator at the beginning of the coil so the value ends up getting put back in memory again and travels round the coil of flat wire again. Now IBM's terminal controller box essentially had one of these delay line memories for each of the CRTs connected. And we just make sure that the delay line is long enough so the timings work out such that data is coming out in a way that's in time with the scan beam of the CRT so it can draw all the characters in turn. Now this gives us our basic glass TTY. We now have a device that acts pretty much like a TTY, only now it's drawing characters on a CRT. We're also not using any of the main computer's memory, we're using the memory that's inside the CRT controller. But this device is not wildly sophisticated, it's not much more than a typewriter typing on a glass screen. We also have the disadvantage that each terminal is not separate from each other, they all actually share a controller, or at least a number of them do. And then we have the biggest drawback, which is how the memory operates. Because this memory is not randomly accessible, it has to be accessed in order, it makes editing what's on the screen very difficult and slow. And then there's the inherent problem in using vibrations to store data. Now, IBM put some proper effort into trying to shock isolate these things. They were put on shock mounts, there was internal vibration damping inside there. Even when they installed it, they put it on a special coloured carpet so you knew not to walk on that bit of the room. But people did. And that's the core problem with any technology that uses vibration as a way of storing values. 
any other external vibrations change those values. So if you walk next to one of these things, well, suddenly characters started changing on people's screens, or characters started to appear where there are not characters before. You corrupted the display of your users. And having a display technology that can't survive someone walking nearby it or closing a door or shouting loudly is not a great display technology. Fortunately, we were all saved by the invention of the DRAM. The DRAM was an incredible leap forward. It finally gave us a memory technology that was small, compact, and relatively affordable. And finally made possible what many of us refer to as a dumb terminal or a serial terminal. Now the first DRAM designs were done in the 1960s, around 65, but by 73 we had commercially available DRAM chips. And this is why in the 70s the serial terminal becomes the dominant display technology in business. Now there are a ton of companies at this time get into the terminal game. But the two companies that really set the standard for these things were the two biggest computer companies of the time, IBM and DEC. In 71, IBM introduced the 3270, a terminal that all their later terminals would remain compatible with. In fact, there are still software implementations of the 3270 available for pretty much every operating system. Power term might be the one you're fairly familiar with if you've used it. Also, a lot of IBM point-of-sale systems were based around 3270 as well. DEC also produced a number of terminals as well, starting with the VT-05, then the VT-52, and then the VT-100, which kind of set the standard for most things going forwards then from the DEC point of view. In fact, DEC's VT standard is what your terminal software emulates on Linux, for example, when you load a shell window or Mac. There's even something called Hyperterminal that ships with most copies of Windows. That's got VT terminal emulation in it as well. So the way these terminals work is you connect them up to the computer. And in the case of DEC and most other terminal manufacturers, this was done using a serial port. Mostly. There are some other ways to connect it, and IBM's world is just... Yeah, let, let's not get into SNA. But the VT220 you can see in front of you, that is connected via a serial port. So, via the serial port or whatever, the computer is able to stream data to the terminal, and the terminal is able to stream keyboard input back to the computer. Now, what the computer streams to the terminal is a mixture of just the text and numbers it wants to display on the screen, along with a number of control sequences for the terminal, usually known as escape sequences. These let you do things like change the foreground and background colour of the text. They may let you change the font, or whether it's italic, or whether it's bold. They can also move the text cursor around the screen, so you can shift where text is going to be displayed to a different location on screen. You can erase characters that are on the screen. You can scroll the screen up or down. Now, not every terminal supports that. And on some terminals, you can even do fairly clever things. Like on the 3270, you can send fonts to the terminal, your own custom design fonts. So, for example, an application could have its own graphics font, so it could do its own boxes and pop-outs and menus and dialogues, for example. And some terminals just had their own built-in graphics character set for doing that too. Now, initially, every terminal vendor had their own proprietary set of escape sequences. And this created a bit of a problem for operating system vendors. Well, except for IBM, who couldn't be bothered at supporting anyone else's terminals. Which is why, for example, in Unix, you have the TermCap library that sits between the operating system, which sends its own set of TermCap control sequences, and then TermCap produces the ones whichever terminal it thinks you're currently set on. That's why in a modern Unix environment, like Linux for example, if you export all your variables, you see there's one entitled term that tells it what terminal type you're currently on. Now, fortunately, a standard for terminal control codes actually came into existence thanks to ANSI. And this is what the VT100 terminal implemented, and is one of the reasons why it's so successful. This ANSI terminal standard would also later get used by bulletin board systems in order to control how text was displayed to users. Now, I'm temporarily going to just park this whole text terminal thing for a moment or two, and we're going to look back again at the vector display side of things again. Why teletypes have been busy developing into terminals? The world of vector displays was not completely unchanged. They had also followed a path as well. Now, initially, these displays, like the one in the DEC PDP-1, that needed to keep a list of vectors in the machine's memory so that the system could keep redrawing those vectors on the screen. However, much like the teletype moving into the glass TTY phase, companies developed external units that could go outside of the machine that had their own memory that could keep that vector list going. So, for example, IBM created the 2250, which was an external unit with its own optional buffer that could drive four vector CRTs. That way, the vector list could remain outside of the main computer's memory, and four users could simultaneously use their vector displays. And that unit only cost $280,000 in 1970, 
So that's $280,000 in 1970s money. I told you memory was expensive back then. But from this version of the unit, it evolves further and we start getting vector terminals that are much more like the serial terminals you'd see during that 70s time period. One of the most significant from this period was the Tektronix 4010. Unfortunately, I don't have one to show you, so you'll just have to deal with these nice photos I've found of it. Now, to keep a number of vectors displayed at the same time, this would still need an awful lot of memory even when we start getting into DRAMs. But that's not how these terminals work. If you remember the Williams Kilburn tune we mentioned at the beginning of the video, the memory storage technology using CRTs, well, these terminals work kind of like that. Now, I'm not going to go into the physics of how this works, but basically, when a line is drawn on the screen, it stays there in these terminals. This means there doesn't have to be a circuit constantly refreshing the display, and thus no need for a list in memory of what to draw. Lines drawn on the screen will stay on the screen whilst there's still power. Now, this creates the unfortunate side effect that you can't just stop a line from being drawn on the screen simply by not drawing it the next time it needs refreshing. In fact, to remove a line, you have to blank the whole screen and then draw everything else again. So it really does work like an etch sketch But because of this lack of need for RAM, or at least RAM in a conventional sense, the resolution of these monitors could be incredibly high. They're really not that far off what you could do with a modern 4K display, just, you know, in 1970. You know, with the limitations of an etch sketch Now, these things are still not cheap by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a lot more affordable than $280,000. Their widest use case is probably for CAD design at this point, although you do start to see them appear in the television and film industries. Because there isn't a refresh cycle like there is in a conventional CRT TV, when you film these things, or film them with a video camera, they don't appear to flicker. This means they're great for having on set where you want some computer display in the background. So for example, here's a photograph of the bridge set from Battlestar Galactica, well, the 70s version. And there are a few of these tectonics terminals on set so they have a computery look going on. If you're a filmmaker wanting to include some wireframe animations, well, you can display that on the terminal, photograph it, blank it, do the next frame, keep going. So these storage tubes played a pretty essential role in early computer graphics on film and TV. Now, to this point, I need to change focus again. So far, everything we've been discussing has been in the world of mainframes and mini computers. But at the beginning of the 70s, thanks to the sudden existence of microchips and DRAMs, and of course, the microprocessor, we get the microcomputer. Unlike all the other areas of computing we've discussed so far, where it was driven largely by academia, research institutes, business, the microcomputer really starts to get driven more by hobbyists than anyone else, or at least in the early years. The early machines at the beginning of the 70s, they pretty much tend to be made by the person who's using it, or be built using some form of reference design published in the magazine, and sometimes even kits that people have purchased. The first companies to start making a machine that you can actually buy as a complete computer ready to go are the likes of Altair, SWTPC, and MSI. Now, these computers are just pure computers, like a mini computer is. There's a central processing unit and some memory and a bus, and that is about it. There is no display built into these things. After all, it's hard enough to make and sell a computer at this point, never alone worrying about things like displays, let alone graphics. So this is where the teletype gets a second life. If an early microcomputer user wants to interact with this machine and do slightly more than just toggle the switches on the front, they're gonna need a device like a teletype. So that's what people use. It's easy enough to add a serial port to these things. And then you can connect your teletype and suddenly you've got a way of interacting with the machine. You can input text, numbers, etc., and get stuff displayed back to you. And if you've got one of the ones of a paper tape reader, well, that suddenly gives you a way to load and store programs. This, for example, is why early versions of Microsoft Basic came shipped on paper tape. It's also why text adventures like Colossal Cave managed to gain a really big following at this period because people had the kind of display technology that works well for text adventure. I mean, try doing Pac-Man on a typewriter. Of course, as the 70s progresses, serial terminals become a lot more affordable and you see people switching over to using those over teletypes and they create basic cassette audio interfaces that let them save their programs onto audio tape and retrieve them that way. Now, use of serial terminals and TTYs still remains relatively common as we go through our single board computer phase when you get the likes of the Kim 1. You also find quite a few people hooking these things up to 
Sinclair's Mark 14 and Acorn System 1 as well. But there becomes a growing awareness that in the world of the microcomputer, you've got a lot of what, well, a terminal can do already in there. What you're missing is a few basic components to allow it to do both jobs in one box. And this is what we see starting to emerge. First with third parties developing cards to put into those early micros that happen to have a bus you can stick cards into, like the Altair, that have a bit of additional memory on there, and a number of the ICs that you might see deployed in a serial terminal, like a character generator and a CRT controller. With the addition of a basic RF modulator, well, then you can get this thing to drive your television. Then people start thinking to build this stuff directly into the computer. Now you can see this example of the Apple One board. The Apple One is a super primitive version of this idea, which is probably one of the reasons why they didn't stick with it for very long. But the bottom half of this board, the two rows of ICs you can see, that's the computer. The top half of this board, the next two rows of ICs you can see, well that's the serial terminal. And you can see where they link one to the other with a serial port in the middle of the board. However, in 1977, we get a number of machines released that have a much more sophisticated version of this idea. And that's in the form of the TSR-80, the Apple II, and the Commodore PET. Although all of these machines are still pretty heavily focused on text, for example, the Commodore PET can't do anything other than text. If it wants to do graphics, it actually uses a series of graphic characters to do graphics, known as PETSKI. The TSR-80 has a similar scheme known as semi-graphics, which again uses a custom set of characters to kind of emulate pixels. The Apple II can also work that way in what's known as its low-res mode, but it is the only one of the three that actually has some, well, what we think of as modern raster graphics. As the 70s marches on, more and more companies start making microcomputers, all with different display hardware. Now, for the only common micro-operating system of the time, CPM, this creates a bit of a headache. Initially, all it had to worry about was text. And CPM had a way of dealing with that. It just assumed you had attached a terminal that was ASCII compatible. And every unique model of computer had its own bit of software known as the BIOS that did the abstractions, how to get in and out of the serial port, that sort of thing, and get the text displayed. Now, this worked really well for the majority of text-based applications on CPM, where you just wanted to get some basic text on the screen. Where an application wanted to do something a little bit more sophisticated, well, often it would come with a configuration program where you could input the escape sequences for your particular terminal to achieve something. Often the manual would come with examples for the common terminals, like an anti-compatible VT100 or a Y60. As computers started to build this stuff in, well, they would emulate the common ANSI terminal escape sequences as well. This is where you get machines starting to get into the whole we're a business computer because we do 80 column mode stuff, because that's what a VT100 terminal would do. Hence Commodore and their Commodore 128 and its CPM compatible mode, and the fact that they really boasted about that they could do 80 column mode in it. But as the 70s wore into the 80s, and more and more machines started to be able to do bitmap graphics, well, this created a bit of a problem for CPM. They did not have a good way to deal with that. If you want to do graphics in CPM, you had to write your graphics code for one particular computer. That meant if someone with a different model of computer took your CPM program and it did graphics, well, it wouldn't run on that other computer. You'd have to do a special version for that machine. And that killed the big feature of CPM, which is I could buy a CPM application and I could run it on any CPM compatible machine that had the same processor that, that application was written for, the most common one being a Z80. Now eventually CPM did come up with a solution to this problem, a standardized graphics extension they could run across multiple machines, known as GSX. The problem for CPM was it was all a bit too little, a bit too late. The problem is, while they were working on this, IBM had created their PC and was starting to ship MS-DOS with it. And as the PC started to take over the market, so did DOS. And this burgeoning market for multiple vendors running CPM, supplying the business market, died surprisingly quickly, eventually to be replaced by IBM PCs and IBM PC clones running MS-DOS. Of course, MS-DOS also had a text terminal legacy it needed to deal with. Initially, DOS used its own control characters to do, to control its own text output. But soon by version 2, it shipped with ANSI.sys, which I know most of you MS-DOS users would have loaded without thinking what it is, and that enabled you to do the ANSI control sequences to manage how your text output worked, which made porting your software to DOS a lot, lot, lot easier. Now, we're briefly going to step away from the world of microcomputers for a second, 
because while all this development had been going on in the microcomputer space all the way through the 70s into the beginning of the 80s, well, the terminal graphics world had not stood still. Text terminal vendors really started to get maybe a little bit jealous of the vector terminal people and also the microcomputer people decided that they needed their terminals to be able to do graphics as well. Now you may be thinking, why bother? Surely the microcomputer is just going to take over, right? The IBM PC exists, or is about to. Well, no, mini computers stayed around for a really long time. Most major business applications were already running on this. Microcomputers got their foot in the door in business mostly through small businesses or very small departments needing just that little bit of computing, or companies that really hadn't embraced computing in any way up until this point. So it's very much in the interest of mini computer vendors to keep developing on and improving terminals. So in 1981, we get the first of these graphic standards, Regis, introduced in 1981 by DEC and their VT125 terminal. This is a series of control codes they introduced that allow you to do vector graphics. So you could do lines, curves, fills, text, etc., all on one screen. Now, this was great for plotting graphs, for example, but was not exactly rapid as a display technology, and you were definitely not going to be able to play Pac-Man on this thing. Not that DEC was wildly concerned about that. Regis also allowed for color graphics on a number of terminals as well, so you could draw your lines and vectors, etc. in different colors. You could even do your fills in different colors too. Now, this was not DEC's first foothold into doing graphics on terminals. They did have something called Waveform before this, but I think that was fairly short-lived and they didn't keep that going in their terminal line. Regis replaced that. The next major change to terminal displays was that of Sixel. Originally, DEC had developed this for their printers as a way of doing bitmap graphics to a printer. You sent six pixels at a time, hence Sixel. They then introduced this to their terminal line, which meant that finally, terminals could do bitmap graphics. And on some terminal versions, it could even do color bitmap graphics. In fact, as terminal emulation's gone on, we can go quite a high resolution and 24-bit color with this stuff, so it can do quite sophisticated graphics in the Sixel format. Not that the terminals of the time could do that. But by the mid-1980s, terminals and computer graphics, at least in business machines and home micros, were more or less on par. Where the big difference was, was that of bandwidth and latency. The problem with a serial terminal is the serial bit. Serial interfaces are not particularly rapid, and with the display being quite far away from the machine, also there's a degree of latency there. Bandwidth between the CPU and RAM is pretty darn high, especially compared to a serial link. And also, it's really nearby to the CPU, so the latency is very, very low. So why a home micro and a terminal could display similar sort of things, a home micro could animate that stuff much more effectively, hence video games were possible. It's not like they were impossible on a terminal, but yeah, they're a lot more playable than an actual micro and a localized display. The main economic reasons for having terminals as well, well, that was starting to go away. Cost-wise, it was becoming realistic to put a computer on everybody's desk rather than having one computer you're trying to share between multiple users. Also, RAM has now dropped to the price where having some inside the computer being used to run the display, well, that's not unreasonable now. However, there is one last gasp of this terminal approach to doing things, and that's called X-Windows. Various Unix workstation and mini computer vendors needed a way to have a GUI. Previously, they'd all been using serial terminals and teletypes as their display devices. But obviously, the latency and bandwidth really wasn't going to cut it for doing a GUI, even for the best of serial terminals. And the solution that most Unix vendors adopted, and also VMS, was X-Windows. The design of X-Windows kind of still embraces the terminal idea, in that part of their design case was they were going to still allow for X terminals to exist that would still connect back to a bigger machine. Let's have a little look at how it works. Now, the big central part of X-Windows is the thing known as the X server. The X server handles the display itself, and also keyboard and mouse input. Any application wanting to use X-Windows connects to the X server, and using the X protocol, it sends what it wants displayed to the X server. And the X server sends back any input-related events like key activity or mouse clicks. So this thing works very much in the same sort of vein as a serial terminal, only instead of things happening over a serial line, it's now generally happening in IP packets instead over a local area network. I can run an X server locally, and I can have applications locally talking to that X server. But likewise, I can log into a remote machine and run my X application there, and it will talk back to my display. Or I could just be using an X terminal device that runs no applications locally, it's just an X server. 
In fact, my university did have a couple of those that were still around in the mid-90s, and they worked about as well as you think they might. X even included a protocol to allow X terminals to go discover servers that they might want to log on to. But X was not immune to the latency and bandwidth problems we discussed earlier for serial terminals. Yes, there was a lot more bandwidth, but it's not like everyone didn't know about the problem. But it did fit this terminal-like model that Unix was already using. But a few Unix versions just ignored the idea of X Windows completely and went their own way. For example, the next step operating system from Next, you know, the thing that would eventually become part of Apple, that used Display Postscript locally, so it didn't actually bother with X Windows. SGI kind of also ignored the X Windows thing too. Now, other operating systems for various micros like Windows, Amiga OS, Risk OS, etc., they much more closely coupled how graphics worked with what the application was doing. Essentially, they put a library in place that you would call, and that would do the drawing into main system memory, and the chips would just go at that. Now, this meant you didn't have any of the remote features where the application ran and where the application displayed its output were one and the same machine. Later on, we would get systems that would read back out again of screen memory to produce an image that could be sent over a network, but that came a bit later. This would speed things up considerably for those applications, because we don't have the latency issues because there's a lot less cruft in the way even when running locally, and we have a lot more bandwidth because we're just writing directly into memory effectively. This very close coupling also between applications and local hardware meant it's a lot easier to take advantage of any hardware acceleration our graphics hardware happens to provide. Because as the 80s goes on, graphics chipsets and computers cease being just dumb frame buffers, or at least they do outside of the world of PCs, and start having features like hardware sprites, hardware accelerated line drawing, hardware memory copy. Now all these features are very useful for video games, which is what's driving quite a lot of this stuff, but also for GUIs. For example, the memory copy feature, that gives you a way of doing hardware accelerated window dragging. Sprites can be used for your mouse pointer. And all of this hardware acceleration continues apace until we get the next big major change in display technologies. Now, I'm not going to go into this one in detail because, well, this video has gone on long enough and the history of 3D hardware and computing definitely can be its own video at some point. But suffice it to say, SGI had introduced quite a lot of 3D graphics technology and suddenly in the mid 90s that became available to regular PC users thanks to companies like 3DFX and this probably was the last straw to the old fashioned world of X. So in the new release of X Windows it gained a new extension that allowed an application to set up a shared memory buffer with the X server and it would just put stuff into that memory buffer and the X server would display it. Well, okay, there are some caveats around that, but you can look at the X fixes and X damages extension for that stuff. Also, obviously, the application, the X server, needs to be running on the same machine for that to work, although that was the majority use case by this point in time. So, for people using X this way, the X display worked a lot more like graphic displays of other computers did, you know, like in the Windows or Mac OS. The X server had now just become essentially a, a pretty bad piece of our PC with weird locking issues. Hence the effort in the Linux world to shift over from using X Windows to Wayland that's been going on now for the last 10 years or so. Because essentially X's design model doesn't really work for the modern world and hasn't done for a long time, but we've managed to paper over quite a lot of the cracks for a surprisingly long period of time. It's interesting to note that the other big Unix flavor out there, that of Mac OS X, doesn't use and never has used X Windows. Well, this is drawing us towards the end of what I'm going to cover in this video, and if your favourite display technology wasn't in here, and there are a few I've not brought up, as I try to just concentrate on the main sweeping trends that were going on, then I am sorry, but if you think it's particularly interesting, make a comment in the section below, and I might well do a video on it at some point in time. The other thing we've not covered in any way really is the change in screen technologies as well, how we've moved away from CRT to LCD. And the reason I've not brought it up, apart from the sentence that I just said, is that's a lot more about the screen technology itself. It's not really got much to do with what's going on inside the computer itself. And that's the area I wanted to concentrate on for this video. And how changes in the cost of various components for the computer drove what display technologies did become successful and would get created, and why you would need those display technologies in the first place. If you've made it all the way to this point, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. And why not come and discuss this stuff with us in the comment section below? 
And if you like this video, why not use the little button that's used to indicate such a fact to YouTube? They, they've got a special button for it. Look, it, it, it looks like a little thumbs up. I would also like to thank a bunch of the people who helped make this video possible. In particular, Dave, who let me film his teletype machine. Tony and the Center for Computer History for organizing the retro event where I could film, well, quite a few of the bits in this, actually. And also, of course, Paul and Pete, who helped hook me up with the VT220 terminal you got to see. Again, another retro event organized by Tony in the museum. Are we sensing a theme here? If you'd like to help this channel out, then why not hit the subscribe button as it's free? And it helps YouTube tell people that these videos exist.